Good afternoon and welcome to the second webinar in our new series for occupational therapists. Success in the educational environment, it's not all about grades. My name is Angela Sullivan, Medical Project Manager, and I will be your moderator this afternoon. This webinar is being provided as part of the Tourette Health and Education Program, a program of the Tourette Association of America in partnership with the CDC. During the webinar, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You might ask questions or share comments using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player at any time. We will collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. I would like to mention that funding for this webinar was made possible by our cooperative agreement with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views expressed by speakers and moderators do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services, nor does the mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. government. The Academic Affairs Committee of the University of Alabama, Birmingham School of Health Professions has approved this program for one contact hour of continuing education credit. In order to claim your credit at the end of the presentation, there will be a QR code that you can scan with your phone to complete an evaluation. You will also receive a follow-up email once the webinar has closed with a link to the survey if you have trouble accessing it via the QR code. Lastly, please take note of the handout section of the control panel. There you will find additional resources to download, such as TAA toolkits, as well as today's PowerPoint presentation. Before we get started, I want to briefly introduce our speaker this afternoon, Dr. Jan Rao. Dr. Rao is a retired faculty member of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. While on faculty, she served in administrative teaching and research positions while continuing to practice in pediatrics. In 2004, she graduated from Nova Southeastern University with her clinical doctor in OT. In 2010, with an increased focus in pediatrics, program development, and service to underserved populations, Dr. Rao was the first OT to develop and coordinate a comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics program for children with tic disorders. As of 2019, Children's slash UAB has been an independent TAA center of excellence designated by the TAA. In addition, Dr. Rao serves as on TAA's medical advisory board and is the co-director of the Children's UAB Center of Excellence. Her other activities include research in occupational performance areas of youth with TS and TDs. She is a trainer in CBIT for OTs and provides numerous presentations for medical professionals and educators in and around the Southeast. Thank you so much, Dr. Al, for being here. And without further ado, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Angela, and welcome everyone. And happy OT month. Um, as Angela said, my name is Jam Rao, and I'm going to take you through this presentation today. Um, hopefully, by the end of it, you will have a better understanding of both the letter and the spirit of the laws, which allow you as a school-based uh, practitioner to intervene with this particular group of youth um, with tic disorders. You'll be able to identify three to five stressors for youth with tic disorders in the educational environment and also be able to describe um, several ways of, that OT can enhance the educational en environment for youth with uh, tic disorders. So let's talk a little bit first about just what is the educational environment? What does that mean and what does it include? Certainly it is referring to academics, but it's so much more than that. It's really everything under the domain um, of practice for occupational therapists. So it's the social relationships that children develop and maintain um, and manage as they go through their academic years. It's ADLs, um, it's recreation, both inside and out, it's their play and leisure. Um, it's both access and use of needed materials and supplies for the classroom, for extracurricular activities, um, and in really any setting that they're in, um, inside and out, uh, of the um, facility itself. It's also those extracurricular activities like library and band, choir, art, foreign languages, drama, field trips, all of those things that are really included in a child or student's day in school. So don't think about it just as the subject areas, that a child, um, that the classroom that the child is or a student is sitting in, but it's all aspects of the educational environment. Also things like driver's education 
And for those of us that work with um, youth and even adults who um, have tick disorders, driving can be one of those situations which um, causes the person to be anxious and nervous about their driving skills, but also just in terms of um, how others are reacting to them on the road. Um, for those of you that tuned in two weeks ago and heard uh, Margie's um, presentation, you got a really good idea of all the coexisting conditions that um, can be present for a person with tick disorders, anxiety being at the top of the list. So if you're an anxious person, you have an anxiety disorder, and you also have ticks, being on the road behind a wheel um, can be very nerve wracking. Then compound that by being a new driver and um, it, it can be very alarming to the person. For most of us that work with youth in our uh, CBIT programs, um, a lot of our, our patients tell us that they really don't wanna drive. They have no interest in driving. And when you dig a little deeper, usually the reason behind that is because they're very nervous of having ticks when they're driving. Now this can be especially um, troublesome if they have head, neck, and eye ticks, but really any tick can be a problem for them. So the driver's education arena in the um, environment of education can, can be something that is both alarming to them, but also um, an area that you'll find as we continue to talk that you may interface with them in. And then the actual environment itself, getting into the environment, being able to get around, negotiate the environment, and also out of. And for so many students right now, that also includes virtual environments. Okay, so why are we here? Do ticks negatively impact concentration and attention or a student's engagement in activities and tasks, or maybe even their safety in the educational environment? The answer is yes, they absolutely can and do um, in all of these situations. So these are students who really do need you. And I, I wager to say that many of you do not have kids with tick disorders on your caseloads. And if you do, I'm, I'm applauding you <laughs> for uh, knowing who those students are and also picking them up for services. Um, and hopefully after today's um, lecture, many more of you will, will see the need for doing that and um, have um, maybe some more knowledge about how you would do that. Okay, so the scope of practice in the school environment um, looks a little bit like this. And this was taken directly from uh, the, the school system guide um, from, the, from AOTA. Um, occupational domains include ADLs, education, social participation, health management, recreation, leisure, play, rest and sleep. So I know you guys are all very familiar with these domains. But as we think about a student in the educational environment who has a tick disorder and even one other coexisting condition, anxiety or ADHD or OCD or dysgraphia, if you think about that student and then think how they get through their day as they negotiate all of these various domains, you can imagine how a tick disorder with, like I said, just one other coexisting condition can, might present problems for that student. They might have difficulty staying focused and being able to concentrate in each one of these domains. Um, they might have difficulty actually finishing assigned tasks or getting things done in a timely way. Or maybe they do everything that they're supposed to do, but they forget to turn things in. So if this is a student who has ADD or ADHD and Tourette, then um, they oftentimes are those very students who may do the work, but the next day they get to school, they forget to turn their homework in, or if they're a virtual student, they forget to upload it to the website. And you know, a couple of weeks goes by and they're failing a class. And, as the parents and the student delve into that, they find that they're missing a lot of assignments. They don't have grades for those assignments. Parents and students start looking through the backpack, which is 
usually a mess or maybe binders or folders and things are just kind of crammed in there and lo and behold there's all the work completed but it was never turned in now i know for those of you school system therapists this is not a new story and you could um, replace this diagnosis of um, tick disorder with with countless others and be telling the same kind of story but I say that I give you this story to say that these kids are very similar to a lot of other kids on your caseload. They have a lot of the same issues that many of the kids with different kinds of diagnoses have. So all the more reason that you should be seeing these kids. Okay. There are a lot of you in school system practice. About 25% of our practice is made up of school system practitioners. So 25% of occupational therapists and 18% of um, certified OT assistants are providing services to early intervention and school-based um, environments. You know your roles, but just um, for those, if there are other people um, on the call, just to, to give a little clarification, the occupational therapist is basically responsible for the evaluation, the supervision of the uh, certified OT assistant, Reevaluation and discharge in the school system. And typically, the OT assistant is providing the actual therapy to the individual, communicating and supporting teachers and paras regarding the technology or engagement in activities and environments, um, and might also be, then be providing um, you know, necessary equipment or supplies to that person or to those uh, teachers and, and paras as well. Um, one thing I want to I want to say, um, and it kind of goes without saying, but I, I hear stories um, from parents all the time because I've done independent evaluations um, for schools and um, in the state of Alabama now for about 20 years, um, and I hear a lot of times from parents that they really didn't know who was providing the service to their child in the school, on the IEP or on the 504 plan, the um, the OT services were written up as OT would provide, but they never really understood the clarification between the OTR and the COTA. Um, so I think for those of you that, that don't designate who is seeing the child and, and what roles each person plays, you know, transparency is always best. Um, and it's also just another opportunity to educate people about the various roles um, of, our, of our practice and of our um, profession. Um, but I want you to also think about the service delivery element. Um, it can be for groups, both those at risk for academic and or behavioral issues, for populations like the general education classes, but also administration and staff. And obviously the service delivery can be for individuals or the individual student. So when you think about each one of those areas, there may be more that you can be doing in the schools that you're providing services to. And I know when I say the words, you may be able to do more, you probably cringe because most of you in school-based practice are covering so many schools. Um, and the last thing you wanna hear is about another population of students that you can pick up for services, um, or uh, you know, it, the last thing you wanna hear is how you can broaden the services that you're already providing to another group or population but um, in this particular case it it really um, your involvement with these students is is so needed and there's such a void um, for those of us that are are seeing kids and students and adolescents with um, tick disorders we we hear this all the time but they are not getting the services that they need from occupational therapists and a couple of reasons uh, or some of the reasons that that's true are the very reasons that we're doing this series of, of talks. And we, we want to make sure that OTs understand what these kids look like, what their problems might be, and also making sure that you understand your tools and resources to be able to then serve them. Um, there's also, um, for those of you, uh, again, in the school system, you probably know about the Every Student Su um, Succeeds Act of 2015, or it's often referred to as ESSAID. Um, 
it supports and recommends um, exploring the dynamic connections among the student, occupations or activities, and the environment, which are critical during service delivery. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about more, excuse me, we're going to talk a little more about that um, as we go forward in talking about the laws and legislation. But I want to draw your attention to that one because that's one that, um, like so many of the others, that AOTA has specifically uh, legislated to become involved with. So you need to understand um, the legislation that supports your way in seeing not just this population, but every population of students that you're serving in the schools. You need to understand the law yourself and not the interpretation necessarily that the school is giving you. Um, and I know I'm a little jaded on this, but um, doing independent evaluations for the last 20 years, I um, have come to learn that um, you know, even the terrific schools, even the schools that are just the very best, are not going to just offer um, parents and students things um, unless they're asked. And so parents need to be equipped with, obviously, their rights, knowing what their, their child can and should be getting in school. But you as a therapist, you the one that is providing the service, also needs to understand the law as it's written and not necessarily what the school is telling you. It's in their best interest to, well, I'll leave it at that for right now. Okay, so the first thing we're going to start with, I know you all are very familiar with IDEA, um, but part B is what mandates access to occupational therapy. and um, that is as a related service. And this is for eligible students um, with disabilities between the ages of three and 21 years of age. Now, this is a federal um, legislative uh, piece of work. And so there's, this is not negotiated state by state, okay? Um, and this one is fairly clear cut. Most uh, therapists that, that we in, talk to around the country understand this. Um, and there's really not a lot of, uh, I think, confusion about what is IDEA. Um, where we get a little more, um, or maybe less clarity and even less awareness is with the Every Student Succeeds Act of 2015, the ESSA. Um, it ensures equal opportunity for, for students. Um, sorry, I've got box there that I can't see, um, for all students in grade K through 12, and it builds on previous legisla leg legislation focusing on educational achievement. This bill in particular includes occupational therapy as specialized instructional support personnel. That's you. And it's included in state, local, and school-wide planning activities. So SA is administered through state and local education agencies. This is one of those legislative acts that may look different from state to state. So for you traveling therapists, this one, you know, if you're in Alabama, for instance, you may do things a little bit different here with under this um, guideline as compared to Michigan or California or New York. Section 504 of the Rehab Act. Um, I know you guys are all very familiar with 504s, but I want to make sure that everybody understands the, the depth of a 504 and the eligibility and um, instrumentation of a 504. A 504 is not a consolation prize, okay? So if you have students that don't qualify for IEPs, because they don't necessarily need specialized instruction, they, they're not, you're not doing them a disservice by advocating for a 504 for these students. Um, this again is a federal piece of legislation and it applies to all recipients of federal funds. So if a school, public or private, receives federal funds, then they are mandated to provide 504s for students. And under um, uh, subpart 
D, like dog, that covers the free appropriate public education for preschool, elementary, and secondary education, okay? Um, 504s, again, unlike IEPs, have nothing to do with grades. So you can have a straight A student or an AB honor roll student or even a gifted student who has a 504. Um, and again, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but if there's just one person who's on this call listening that doesn't know about 504s and the, the various ways that um, you can serve a child with a 504, then it's worth going into a little bit more detail here. This is um, 504s, you can actually provide service to like direct service to children, to students on 504s. This is not negotiated state to state. So I know uh, just about every time I speak at the Tourette Association conference and talk at all about schools and eligibility um, for students in school, um, especially with regard to the population of tick disorders, um, there's always an OT in the audience who says, yeah, but in, in my state, we can't provide services. It's not a state to state thing. This is a federal act and 504s do include services for students as well as related services and, or excuse me, related aids and accommodations. So most of us that work with um, students with who have um, tick disorders, whether they're in elementary, middle, high school, or even college, will recommend that these students have 504s um, in place. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute, but um, I want you to think about it as one of those things that it's better to do before there's a crisis. Um, and again, it's not a consolation prize. So, you know, a lot of times parents see the IEP as the gold standard, but there's no reason that the 504 can't provide the um, same kind of service and accommodation for the student with tick disorder, and in some ways may even be better for them. Okay. There's also the Assistive Technology Act of 2004. Um, there are times when this population of student um, with tick disorders does need um, assistance with technology. Um, one of the things that we have learned over the years is handwriting um, can be and often is an issue for students with tick disorders and Tourette. Um, actually, uh, Dr. Simpson, who is on the call, is the first author of a paper that came out in the Australian Journal of Occupational Therapy about that very thing. Um, so we do know that um, handwriting is a problem. And while most kids you know, grow up now with technology, they have their tablets, they have Chromebooks, they have their, their phones, they can pretty much do anything they need to. What we've also found over the years is that many of them do not like relying on the technology if it's gonna make them look different. So if their peers in a class are taking notes by hand, they're writing those notes, that's what the student with the tick disorder wants to do as well. Um, the problem with that is oftentimes then they get home and they can't read their own writing or they can't write quick enough to get all of the notes and all of the content that the instructor has given in the class. So they have these huge gaps in their notes when they get home. And so they're really not adequate for study purposes um, and, and being prepared either for the next day or for a test that may be coming up. So this is where the Assistive Technology Act can help you. Okay, so what are you supposed to do with these kids that I'm advocating and that we're all advocating you see? Some evaluations that you may find helpful to, to do some occupation-based um, evaluation so that you're able to really see what kinds of problems these, these students are having in everyday life. Um, many of us like the COSA, the Child Occupational Self-Assessment. Um, it's a great assessment for to, to determine um, what problems a person is having um, in, in their, from their perspective, and also um, just how important the task or activity is to them. 
So this is a 25 item uh, assessment that allows you to see um, area of difficulty, but also level of importance to the person. The school function assessment um, takes you through the sixth grade, um, is another really good occupation-based assessment that allows you to see the different areas of difficulty in occupations, um, but also looking at um, environment and um, what kinds of accommodations the person might need. Um, the school setting in interview is just that. Um, it's an interview to allow you to to get a perspective both from the student, but also the caregiver, um, the parent, uh, what kinds of problems that the student is having in the particular environment of the school. And then um, again, because of the handwriting issues that, that I talked about just a few minutes ago, there's the test of um, handwriting skills, uh, revised edition that is um, relatively uh, quick to administer little more cumbersome for scoring, but it's quite comprehensive in um, its approach to handwriting and looks at both manuscript and cursive. Okay, so then when you think about what are you going to do with these kids based on your evaluation and, and the kinds of things that you might have discovered on that evaluation, this is just a drop in the bucket um, looking at some of the interventions that might be necessary. Um, and again, try to think back for those of you that um, were on for Margie's um, presentation a couple of weeks ago when she talked so thoroughly about the, the issues that kids with tick disorders can have. And then you layer in the coexisting conditions and obviously the, the problems just get magnified. Written expression um, can be a, a big issue as we've talked about. Just engaging, participating and engaging in, in the various occupations and activities um, that students have in their daily life. If you're ticking, you know, every, I don't know, 15 times an hour, um, or for some of these kids, it's, you know, pretty much constant. Let's say they've got a, a head tick where they're just kind of bobbing their head up and down like yes, no. Um, and that tick happens, you know, 40, 50 times in an hour, then participating and engaging in um, occupations and activities and tasks in the school environment or the educational environment um, can be difficult for them. Um, it's annoying, it's aggravating, it's embarrassing. Um, and a lot of times the, the kids will often resort, resort to just, you know, not, not engaging. They would rather just not be seen and not be noticed. Um, so that because if I'm not noticed, then you're not noticing my ticks. Um, emotional regulation is also a big part of what we're, we're working with, um, with these students who have tick disorders. Um, this is a, a disorder of um, inhibition. So if they are unable to filter, if they're unable to um, ignore different sensations and signals and um, um, feedback that they're responding to, stimuli, excuse me, stimuli that they're, they're responding to, then there's gonna be emotional um, irregulation for these kids. And then if you layer in depression or anxiety, then obviously this just goes over the top. And it's not just seen in the home environment, but you often will see this in the school environment as well. Unfortunately, these kids get labeled far too often as behavior problems, um, willful students who um, just don't want to do the right thing, or you know they get tagged as lazy, um, unfortunately. So um, emotional regulation is a, is a big area that we spend quite a bit of time on with, with these students. Um, and if not initially, then sometime you know, throughout the, the course of their educational years, we're usually dealing with um, this particular issue at some point with them, um, with just about everybody that we see. There's also just the environmental awareness and, and modifications that may need to be made. And this will be a little more clear as we talk about actual um, examples of um, uh, modifications and or accommodations um, that a student might need. But if you've got a child that has, um, let's say, arm and hand ticks, and, and some of those um, arm ticks can be uh, 
robust, you know, where there's a lot of um, maybe shoulder abduction or the arms are kind of, fl you know, flying up above the head and you've got them standing in line to go to the library or, you know, you're doing a, a an obstacle course with younger students or something. Um, somebody's going to get hit, somebody's going to get maybe pushed, um, somebody's going to, you know, have an arm or a hand flung in their face, and um, it only takes a couple of times with young students to, for that to really annoy someone, but it really only takes a couple of times for that to happen, even in a high school setting, for that to annoy someone, and, you know, before you know it, you've got um, an argument or maybe even a fight that's breaking out. So, um, just being aware of the environment and what the needs of these students might be, um, having a little more space, being able to sit, um, you know, someplace in the classroom where they can be on the end of a row, or if they are sitting, um, maybe not so much now because of COVID, where, where we're trying to have a little more social distance, um, but not every school and not every environment in the school is able to attain that. So if for instance, in the cafeteria, if you're not able to sit a little bit further apart from your peers, then you know this can be a real issue for you. And even if you're not ticking, it doesn't mean that you're not thinking about, oh gosh, what if I tick right now and somebody is you know six inches away from me, or maybe they're a full foot away from me, but you know my arm or my hand or my foot or my leg could still reach them. And if I have a leg or a foot tick and I'm afraid that I might kick somebody, then I'm sitting through my entire lunch being very, very anxious about that tick happening. So these are some things to think about with regard to the um, environment and just modifications, simple, simple modifications that could be made. Another huge area that we spend a great deal of time on, um, other than just helping to uh, or teaching students how to actually manage their, their tics, um, is this whole area of executive functioning skills. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these students um, with tic disorders and Tourette, they do have executive dysfunction. Um, and as, as school expectations increase, as demands are, um, get greater, and as they um, accelerate through the grades, um, junior high and high school, executive functioning skills really are imperative and um, not not having um, or, or having dysfunction in one area or another of executive function can really become uh, problematic for these students. In general, students who have tick disorders are of average intelligence or higher. So this is not a, a, a population of kids who uh, typically have issues with cognition, um, but they do oftentimes have issues with executive dysfunction. So, you know, planning and organization and time management and all of those things that are so needed, um, especially in this day of uh, virtual school where they're having to do so much on their own and cruise between, you know, several websites and um, several links just to find out what their assignments are and where they're supposed to upload them to. Um, we, first of all, where do they download them from? Um, and then they have to sign on to a Google Meet and be there on time and maybe participate in a certain way. And they're supposed to be prepared for that and, and maybe have something that they can share on their screen. All of those skills that are, are second nature to many of our students um, are very difficult for this population of students. Um, just yesterday, I was working with a young girl in Washington State who um, is unfortunately having a great deal of difficulty in this um, arena. And, uh, you know, we were talking about various apps and um, just different um, forms and, and checklists and, and um, e-files that she can use to help stay organized. She's a very bright student. She's in gifted classes, but she is... Um, failing miserably when it comes to being organized and managing her time. Um, so she, you know, she'll spend three hours on something that she's going to get, you know, 5% of her overall grade from, and then she spends an hour and a half on something, you know, like a midterm. 
Um, so she just really doesn't have um, the skills to, to think through that process. And unfortunately, I mean, she's a 10th grader now, but in a few years, she's looking at college. And, um, you know, I can honestly say that when I was on faculty teaching master's level um, OT students, many of them struggled with the same things. Um, so if we can get to these students and, and equip them with skills and tools and teach them how to use those um, in a very competent uh, way, then, you know, their, their later years in, in high school and, and college can, can be so much easier and, and much more successful for them. And then lastly, management of just their educational materials and supplies. And this is everything from remembering to bring your pencils with you and pens, um, having you know paper or having your Chromebook or having your planner. Um, but it's also, you know, like, did you remember your lunch? Or do you remember your code to get um, to get lunch in the cafeteria um, if somebody doesn't recognize you and know your code for you? Um, it's all of those those same kinds of things. It's you know, if you have a locker, do you know how to get into your locker? Can you can you work the combination lock? And then once you get into your locker, it's you know, is it a mess? Do you have to like dig through? A, a year's worth of stuff to, to get the one piece of paper that you need for class right now? Um, or is it nicely organized and maybe things are labeled? Um, those are those are tasks and, and activities that OTs can do with students in the educational environment to help them manage their, their, their things and their spaces so that it works for them. Um, and I mean, we all know there's no one way for everybody, but um, that's the great thing about OTs is we have so many different tricks and um, tricks of the trade that we can share with these students. So I know you guys all hear, um, you know, it has to be, there has to be an educational need for these students, and it can't be a medical issue that is um, that we're trying to get qualified for services in the educational environment. But I just want you to ask yourself a couple of really simple questions when you're when you're trying to negotiate that that whole um, concept. First of all, you know, does the student require assistance to engage and participate in their educational environment in any way at all? Do they require any kind of assistance to engage and participate? And then secondly, is there a need for services? education or accommodations in that environment? If yes, why? Why is the answer yes? What do they need? And in what manner? I know very often now it's it's really tough to get direct OT service for students. Um, and part of that, unfortunately, has really nothing to do with the fact that the student needs or doesn't need the service, but has more to do with the fact that so many of you are covering so many different schools and your caseloads are so enormous that you have to negotiate who gets services based on numbers. Um, and if you take a step back from that, you know, the, the, the root of the question really is, is that the student's fault? You know, the student who needs service, is it their fault that you're being asked to cover so many different schools and pick up, you know, evaluate all of these students and then make decisions about who gets services and who doesn't. Um, because at the end of the day, that particular student still needs something from you. And then it's your job to figure out how best to deliver that service, whether it's in a consultative mode um, or a direct service delivery. Um, and I may not be making friends right now, but <laughs> which is, you know, I'm kind of used to in this arena. Um, but one of the things that you, you really have to consider as an OT in the school environment is, is this a function of the way school system therapists are um, asked to negotiate their time and their expertise? Or is this a function of the student and their needs? Okay. All right. So if you decide that the student needs something, 
And let's say that you are negotiating for the student to get a 504. Um, and I know that in itself can be difficult because you have to be you have to walk a very fine line um, in terms of what your recommendations to parents look like and, and are. Um, but whether it's your recommendation or somebody else's, you agree with the fact that this student needs a 504. Then most of us would say, let's try to, to think safety net. You know, let's try to make sure that that 504 happens before there's a major undoing in the school. Again, these, these students are complex. It's rare that we see a, a, a student with tick disorders that only has ticks. If we see a student in our, or a child in our, our clinic um, of any age that only has ticks, that's like gravy. We, I mean, those are easy, easy kids to work with. We can teach them strategies to manage their ticks using CBIT, um, and we may not see them again, ever. Um, but that is a rare student that we see. The majority of our um, patients and, and clients that we see as Margie pointed out a couple of weeks ago, they come with at least one, if not more, coexisting just, um, conditions. So when you think about, again, that student with tick disorder, Tourette, and anxiety, and maybe OCD, and ADD, those students are complex, and they're going to need a 504 for something, um, one of those diagnoses, if not all of them. And we want to make sure that that happens before um, there's there's a, a big crisis. Um, they're not quick to put into place, um, certainly faster than an IEP, yes, but they're still not fast and you still have to assemble people and get people all on the same page. So the faster you can do it, um, the better. You also want to keep those accommodations broad. So we don't want something that's just going to do the student for this semester or for this year. But think a couple of years down the road, because what the student, you know, the, the student may only be presenting with a couple of ticks right now, and you know, their anxiety that is fairly well managed, but they're in the fourth grade. Um, so what's going to happen when they get into the fifth or the sixth grade? We we don't want to have you know parents calling every every semester or every nine weeks asking for new accommodations. So if you're the one um, working with the parent. Um, and helping get this in place, and we hope that you are after this series of, of lectures, then try, try to help the parent understand that the, the accommodations need to be broad. They don't have to use them, but they're there if they need them, okay? Now, that said, students develop new ticks. That's part of the tick disorder. Ticks wax and wane, and you get new ticks. And sometimes the, the ticks that you've had for a long time become complex ticks. So maybe it was just a simple eye blinking tick to start with. And now it's a head jerk and an eye blink and a grunt sound that all happens. So that simple eye blinking has turned into a complex tick. So we want to try to keep the accommodations as broad as we possibly can to cover, you know, as many different scenarios as we can think of. And like I said, that goes into the planning, planning for several years ahead. Yes, it's going to be, you know, re, uh, it's going to be looked at and reviewed annually, but it doesn't necessarily have to have changes annually. You also want to help the child, um, especially the child, but also the parent advocate for themselves. So when I give a list of, um, when I either conference call in or pre-COVID would actually go and, and be part of 504 eligibility um, and uh, implementation meetings, I would always, the, one of the last accommodations that I would ask for is that the student have a copy of that accommodation page. And they just have several copies of that in their binder, or their notebook, whatever. Um, because on the day that a substitute comes to class and the, the kid is sitting there ticking like crazy because now there's somebody different in the classroom and they don't know them and they're afraid they're going to get asked something or you know, if this child has a vocal blocking tick and, and the bane of their existence is having to read out loud, um, then they're worried that that substitute is going to ask them to read out loud. Um, they may not be able to advocate for themselves with someone that they don't know well or feel comfortable with. But all they have to do is pull out that accommodation list and hand it to the person and 
that should take care of the situation. And if it doesn't, the next thing I tell them is go straight to the office um, and just, you know, be in the office and let them know that you're not comfortable talking about it with the substitute, but you gave them a list of your accommodations. And yes, we all have horror stories of, you know, the substitute teachers or any other teacher that, you know, didn't allow the student a, a particular accommodation. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of fallout for that. But for the most part, um, well-meaning adults <laughs> will accept, you know, uh, something that is official like an accommodation page from a 504. Um, so that takes us to the last one, ensuring the student gets a copy of the accommodation sheet. Okay, so here are some examples of the accommodations. Allowing breaks when necessary during the day, you know, things, anything like trips to the office, going to the bathroom or the water fountain. Um, they don't have to be long breaks, and we actually um, say to the students that they really shouldn't be long breaks. They need to just be long enough for the student to go out, kind of collect themselves. If they have um, strategies that they can they can use for their anxiety or for their tics or whatever, use those, and then get back into class. None of us that work in this um, particular field are advocates for students being out of class or out of school. Um, we're going to be working with the school to get those students back into class and back into the educational environment just as quickly as possible. We also don't want them getting out of things. So we're not going to be advocates of them leaving a class and just not having to do their work, not having to turn things in, not having to take tests. We might ask for some accommodations for them to be able to do that in a more efficient um, or more comfortable way for the students so they're not having to worry if I tick, I'm gonna interrupt somebody or distract someone, but we're not going to be advocating for them to get out of those things. Um, we also um, will a lot of times ask for um, extra time or breaks, especially during lengthy tests or like proficiency exams um, in college um, or if it's a timed test, because again, if you know you're being timed and you have to be able to get through so much in a particular time frame, your anxiety is going to peak. Um, and that's going to be um, off, oftentimes then uh, ticks are going to increase during that time. Um, when we were talking about the environmental kinds of accommodations, um, just allowing for preferential seating um, where students feel more comfortable, um, where they feel like they've got a little more space to kind of stretch out. Um, not not really, um, not literally, but you know, a little more elbow room, I guess. Um, because even just the 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 sense that I'm gonna be kind of trapped between people um, can increase your anxiety. And we know that anxiety is, is a significant trigger for ticks. And then one that I always have to talk to parents in schools about is, you know, not punishing children and students for their ticks or symptoms associated with the tick disorder. And that seems like a no brainer, but I can't tell you how often it happens. Um, so, you know, students are sitting there ticking, they're, they're, they're not able to concentrate, they can't follow through with an assignment, they can't get it done in a timely way. And so, oh, well, everybody goes out for recess or goes to art or goes whatever, but not you, you have to stay and do the work in here because you didn't get it done. That's a, that's a form of punishment, okay? Um, they didn't get it done because they were ticking and they couldn't concentrate. They couldn't, they couldn't stop ticking long enough to maybe write, or they couldn't stop ticking long enough to think about what they were being asked to do. Um, so you may not feel like you're punishing for the ticks themselves, but you actually are. And we have to we have to be very clear about that with parents too, because it's not the child's fault that they have ticks, and it's not something that they're doing because they want to do it. So this, again, it takes a lot of education um, from those of us that work in this area, and we hope that you all will be those people working in this area too. Um, okay, and then just, again, the references and resources that are here for you. Um, those assessments, many of them came from the MOHO Clearinghouse. That link is there for you. Um, there are some other uh, just ideas for you just to kind of get going. I and mean, this could be an exhaustive list that would be more slides than the actual presentation. Um, if you think about executive functioning skills and um, you know some of the other areas of deficit that these kids can often have. So 
by no means is this an exhaustive uh, list, but I, we wanted you to just have some ideas to get you going. So I will stop there and we'll take questions. Great, thanks so much, Jan, for an excellent presentation. As she mentioned, we're now going to begin answering some questions that were submitted during the presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your control panel. We have about 10 minutes, so feel free to ask anything you'd like. Um, we do have Margie on here as well and Heather Simpson, so if you have any additional questions that you have for them, they'd be happy to answer. If we are unable to get to everyone's questions, here at the TAA, we do have a full-time information and referral staff who can answer your questions as well by emailing support at Tourette's.org or giving us a call at one 888 So Jan, I have one question here for you. Mm -hmm. What kind of accommodations do you recommend for students with tics who tick more due to the anxiety over anticipation of being called on by their teacher? I think you touched upon this a little bit. Yeah, that's actually a very good question. Um, and one of the things that I talk to teachers about in that very, um, that very question is allow the student to participate and engage as they want to. So it takes away the, um, the angst on their part of being called on. Um, and what we find clinically and anecdotally is that students actually engage more when they're not fearful that they're going to be called on. So when they get to kind of be in control of, do I participate or not? They actually participate more. Great, thank you. Okay, we have another question. It's a little long, so just let me know if you need me to, to um, repeat it. Okay. At my school, the accommodations listed on the 504 are very brief. It doesn't explain the reason for the accommodation, so often they are not implemented correctly particularly if the teacher doesn't participate in the 504 meeting where an explanation is given. Therefore, the accommodations list wouldn't be well understood. Do you have any recommendations? Uh, well, um, <laughs> I think I would, as the OT, I think what I would do is ask, I mean, whoever it is in your school or in that particular school that coordinates the 504 meetings, I think I would go to that person and ask for more clarity um, and um, just really more expansion of uh, the accommodations. And if necessary, ask for a meeting to, to get that fleshed out a little bit more. I mean, it's, it's obviously not doing anyone any good, the student in particular, if people don't understand what the accommodations are for, um, and if the accommodations are not um, specific enough to provide the student with anything. I, I hope I understood that. Um, let us I have know. A, I another, I have another thought. When I wrote IEPs, and I would do it with 504s, I wrote them from the point of view that that child may be going to a different school district the following year. And I made the information as um, detailed as I could so that when they got the IEP or the 504, they really had a clear picture of what we were looking at for the child. Good idea, Margie. Great, thanks for, for that. Um, if whoever asked, asked this question, if you need more clarification, feel free to let us know. Um, so another question, do you, would you mind sharing some suggestions for a student who may not want to use assistive technology, but is falling behind? Yeah, I actually have this quite a bit, and I'd love to hear Margie and Heather's take on this too, but I actually have this happen quite a lot. And so what I ask the student to do is, um, figure out a particular time of day and place that they are comfortable with that every day or at least three times a week that they go to for a designated amount of time and use the technology then to either transpose um, their notes so that they're still in the educational environment. So if they, um, you know, they take their written notes and then they go to the library, for instance, at two o'clock Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And they spend an hour and they basically are transcribing their own notes. And that way they're still in the school so that if they have questions, if they have holes, if they're missing contact or excuse me, content, 
then they can go to that particular teacher and ask them for, you know, to help them kind of fill it in. So that way, um, and I, I always, um, or I, not always, but I try to um, make sure that they do that on Mondays and Fridays if they don't do it any other days during the week, simply to get started well through the week and also before the weekend um, to ensure that they have everything they need um, if there are tests coming up or projects or, or whatever. So that's just one, one way of, of getting them to kind of negotiate a little bit on that. As they, I find that as they um, are more comfortable doing that in another space, um, oftentimes they'll come um, to clinic and say that they actually, you know, felt okay about doing it in a in a particular class, especially those students in um, junior high and, and, and high school. They may have, you know, some favorite teachers or favorite classes that they're just more comfortable in and will use their technology there, but they won't in other places. Margie, Heather, do you guys have ideas on that too? Um, um, if this is go ahead, Margie. Margie. Oh, I'm sorry, Heather. Um, no, my thought is, um, Jan, as you pointed out, like a favorite teacher, if you can um, present that problem to the teacher and say, is there some way that you could highlight the use of this technology with him or her in the classroom as a, as a benefit, more to say, um, so-and-so is going to um, do some research on this and take notes on it and then share it with the class or in some way try to um, make it a positive thing and, and have the teacher really play it up and the kids be um, in interested in what he's doing. My other thought is that before we recommend assistive technology, we really need to make sure that it's the right fit for the student and yes. uh, present him with the options and then is is this what's going to work for you and why or why not so you need a buy-in from the student I believe um, and maybe take it slow one class at a time or you know like Jen had said okay Heather your turn <laughs> oh thanks I so um, I have found that they tend to like a lot of like the the new um, Apple pens and like the smart recording pens. So if I can convince them that it's cool <laughs> and that it's pretty popular and that my college students are using them, then I can typically get a little bit more of a buy-in. So um, since I have a big college student population and I um, tell them that it's used often in schools um, and in college and it helps them um, and it helps my college students and, you know, that I use it a lot in school, then oftentimes they find that those smart recording pens or those Apple pens tend to be really helpful. So as long as I can convince them it's cool and I can show them a TikTok maybe, a TikTok or a YouTube video of how cool it actually is, then um, oftentimes I tend to get a little bit more buy-in um, from that perspective, along with what Jan and Margie mentioned too. But um, if I can convince them that social media has told them that it's cool, then um, I tend to have a win. Those, those are both great ideas. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, we have one more question. Um, do you have any suggestions for your favorite organizational tools for high schoolers? Oh boy, um, there are <laughs> there are so many. Um, I'll tell you what. I will. Um, I, I have kind of a go-to list. I will send that to Angela and. He can get that out to all the listeners today because there there are just so many. Perfect. Okay, well, it looks like that's all the questions that we have, and we're just about out of time. So thank you so much again for a wonderful presentation. Um, as a reminder, everybody, once the webinar is closed, you'll receive a pop the a screen will pop up for a survey on the presentation, and this is where you can provide some feedback for us. Um, this survey is specific to your experience during the webinar and will help us to improve future programming. And that is not the survey that is required for claiming credit. Um, so in addition to that, you will receive a follow-up email within a few hours with a link to view the recording of the webinar. And this email will also provide additional instructions on how to claim your credit if you were not able to access it via the QR code on the screen now. The webinar will be posted on the TAA's YouTube channel for those who are unable to participate today. 
we encourage you to reach out to us about this webinar or for other ideas and suggestions you, that you may have. As a reminder, in the handout section, there's a few items there as well. Um, in my follow-up email with the resources that Jan will send along, I will include those resources um, in there as well. So with that, on behalf of the Tourette Association, thank you again for joining us and taking the time to view our presentation. Have a great rest of your afternoon, everybody, and thank you again to Jan. Thank you all.